San Jose, California, the capital of Silicon Valley. The region is home to 33 Fortune 1000 companies and the wealthiest populace of the U.S. This technological powerhouse is world famous amongst the likes of Hong Kong and Tokyo. Surely Silicon Valley would have a transit system that would rival them, right? Okay, fine. Well, it should be the most technologically advanced in the country. Uh, in, in the Bay Area, at least. Uh, I mean, can't be right. I mean, it says their rolling stock is from uh, uh, 2002. The SF Bay Area consists of nine counties directly surrounding the Bay. Today, I'll strictly be talking about VTA, or the Valley Transportation Authority's light rail system that serves the San Jose and the South Bay. The agency operates 39.4 miles of standard gauge track across three lines and 60 stations. And the three lines are the orange, the green, and the blue. On today's episode, I'll be riding on every single one of these stations, and because my channel focuses on transit-oriented development, I'll assess every single one of them for how the community around the station embraces its existence overall. Every tech company in the 1980s was bleeding money. This was especially true in the booming South Bay with the industry titans of Apple, AMD, Atari, and Intel, just to name a few. The oil shortage of the 70s, a decade prior, was but a memory in most minds, and Americans were driving more than ever. Giant asphalt parking lots were paved surrounding these sprawling corporate campuses. VTA, though, was following a trend that many mid-sized cities like San Diego and Houston were implementing, a light rail transit system. The general idea was for these tech workers to park their gigantic Cadillac DeVille's at a parking lot somewhere close to the suburban neighborhood and then hitch a ride on a train to their Intel job. After receiving $2 million in feds, VTA was much closer to their goal and eventually in 1987, they opened up the light rail system. To make things easier, I divided the system into a main central corridor and four spurs that come out from it. First, the central corridor. In 1987, only the portion of Civic Center was opened, and it wasn't complete until the following year, all the way to the Convention Center. Let's begin at the four stations in the heart of downtown San Jose. Back in 1982, VTA planners wrote about potential options for a transit mall in downtown. And if you don't know what that is, it's basically a pedestrian mall with either a bus lane or track for a light rail vehicle running parallel to the sidewalks. And out of four potential options that they highlighted, they settled for one that had both buses and LRT on one-way parallel pairs, with both vehicles having their separate rights of way. You can kind of see here in downtown how the bus and light rail load from the same platform, though just on different sides. These stations right downtown are the heart and soul of this whole system, and for a good reason. I mean, they're the most ridden, and downtown San Jose is about as TOD friendly as the city gets. These stations here at Santa Clara and Paseo de San Antonio have a lot going on with tons of food options, tons of mixed use developments, and the atmosphere is just inherently walkable. Close by to St. James Station, there are a multitude of new developments a couple blocks west of here that opened up like City Heights, 188 West St. James, um, and it's also within easy walking distance of San Pedro Square, which is a pedestrian mall full of delicious restaurants and exciting bars that are just jam-packed together and easily walkable. Going back to St. James though, the transit mall kind of ends north of St. James Street and once again converges into a median at First Street, where it will begin its 5.5 mile journey up to North San Jose. Here at Japantown Air, north of downtown, we're sort of close to the city's Japantown neighborhood. There's not much land use diversity here to speak of, uh, granted, there are some single-family houses which are densely packed together, and there's the Barcelona apartment complex that's medium density right across the street. Civic Center can attribute its relatively high ridership uh, to the county offices and jail in, in its vicinity, so it's pretty convenient for people that either work in the public sector or have to attend some sort of court hearing. After a few standalone buildings uh, is Gish Station, which has a modestly sized apartment development right across the street. After Gish, you'll definitely start to notice a gradual change in the general density of the neighborhoods. So we're traveling north, basically from the dense downtown district into the more low density commercial and industrial districts of the city. There's some symbols of community and urbanism at the Century Towers complex right by the Metro Airport station. Karina really has nothing going for it other than a couple of three-star hotels and PayPal on its doorstep. So on my trip, no one got on the train or left at these three stations, and why would there be a reason to? Uh, there's not much to gaze your eyes upon, and at this point, 
It's just a sea of asphalt with like islets of corporate campuses. So north of these, at the River Oaks and the Terminus Tasman stations, you get a huge breadth of fresh air. The Riverview and North Park apartments are right across the street from both of these stations. Uh, the mixed-use element here is in full force with a ton of restaurants at street level here. Going back south, we have the first and newest spur from Convention Center Station to Winchester, and this opened up in late 2005. From the Convention Center Station, it continues on San Carlos Street, making a couple of weird turns until it stops at San Fernando. The huge parking lot here is turning into a mixed-use development with residential, retail, commercial office space in the works, and it's part of Google's huge downtown project. It'll be about 10 years before we even see it open, so we'll see how San Fernando Station kind of performs then. All right, awesome. So it's tunnel time, and that means that the line travels below grade, and we're rising up to meet the big daddy of them all, which is San Jose Diridon Station. This is easily the most important station for the light rail system, and it's a huge Amtrak, Caltrain, and Ace Hub. Uh, this station is huge. It has nine platforms, and there's also a huge TOD called the Cahill Park neighborhood. Uh, it has multi-story developments. There's a huge park in the middle. So we're here at the Cahill Park neighborhood, and it's pretty cool, pretty dense. There's a really nice park right here, super close, uh, within walking distance to the station, and I think it's just awesome. Finally, we have the Vasona Corridor here, south of Derridon, and the rest of the segment finally has its own right-of-way, traveling on former UP rails. And personally, I'm not a big fan of light rail vehicles really being in the median streets. Um, you don't have the right-of-way most of the time. You have to wait for cars at the intersection. And you'll see here at this corridor, this thing's going fast, and it's averaging a cool 50 miles an hour. So on the first stop here at Race Station, um, you have the beautiful mosaic and elements developments right within easy walking distance. And there's even a cute playground here where you can kind of just see trains whiz by, which is awesome. And Fruitdale Station is even better with residential buildings that have first floor businesses, which is a real rarity among suburban developments. Though it's kind of at the expense of crossing a huge four lane expressway. Bascom Station as it is now is okay. There's these apartments right across the street, but they're older and they were built right before the station was in place. Now, I don't know how to feel about the Hamilton station. It's the only above grade station on this corridor, which is kind of cool. It's single tracked with one platform. It looks cool, but like, why does it exist? I mean, it's sandwiched in between two highway ramps. It's surrounded either by a hotel or some office towers or suburbs that don't really have a pathway to get to the station. Now from kind of weird to cool, we're in downtown Campbell, which is a small city just southwest of San Jose. Uh, its station is surrounded with residences, uh, restaurants, and bars. That kind of reminds me of San Pedro Square. 500 people use the station daily, and I can kind of see why. So finally, at the terminus here, we have Winchester Station. And there's one irritating thing that kind of bars Winchester Station from having TOD. Huh. Got these nice apartments right next to the train, and there's, there's no gate whatsoever or even a crosswalk to get there. That's weird, but it's also cool that VTA is actually announcing that they're gonna be engaging with developers to build more affordable housing here. Next up here, we have the second spur from Tasman to Mountain View, which opened up in its entirety in 1999. So starting from Tasman, we're taking this nearly 10 mile journey through dozens of corporate campuses like Samsung and Cisco uh, via Strode. So starting west from Tasman, we're at Champion, which literally has nothing to offer. Now we're reaching Santa Clara. There's this mini strip mall across the street on one side with a few businesses. The other side has some Riverwood Grove apartments and more parking lot duplexes. There's gonna be a cool development right here that's part of the 4,500 units planned by the city of Santa Clara around the station. So for the 49ers fans here and the faithful, the Great America Station is simply marvelous. I don't mind that there's a sea of parking lot here because tailgating is a thing and the fact that transit is here is honestly enough for fans and that the system kind of offers connections to Caltrain and BART. I'm not sure why Old Ironsides as a station exists. Uh, I know the Green Line stops here. It's a block away. Weird. So the Reamwood and Vienna stations allow people in the Casa de Amigos and Plaza de Rey communities to take the light rail, which is infinitely better than an unused corporate office park. Um, but like I said, just because the community is close to it, uh, it's not automatically a TOD. 
So these mobile home parks were built to have spaces for cars and there's not really any density whatsoever. Fair Oaks is across from the good mixed use via apartments whose first floor is almost entirely occupied by businesses. The line kind of twists and turns now on uh, this Java Drive segment and it passes by the forgettable Crossman and Borrega stations. After that, the line turns south on a right of way heading to Lockheed Martin Station. I say that this station is generously named because the actual Lockheed Martin campus is 1600 feet away and the campus is sprawling with parking lots so I'm confused as to why the station was even constructed. Alas, turning west to Moffat Park Station is a Google campus that at least tries to integrate with the station. So behold, one of the biggest wastes of money on this system in my opinion is the Bayshore NASA stop. There's no parking lot so commuters can't even access it, it's far away from anything of interest and there is just a weird entrance to the NASA Ames Research Center. After passing by that and the boring middle field station south of it, we see an oasis in a sea of boredom and mid, which is the Wisman Station. And this development around the station is transit oriented in most aspects. Uh, the property is absolutely massive and pretty walkable in most cases. And I think it's so massive actually that it just needs two stations in my opinion. So if we can just kind of take away old Ironsides and build another platform there, that's completely fine. Finally, after all that, uh, we have our terminus of downtown Mountain View, and we see our sec second connection to Caltrain so far. There's an easy cross-platform connection, a fun downtown area of the city filled with awesome restaurants and shops, um, some townhouses and apartments right south of the station. I love downtown Mountain View. It's my favorite downtown area in the entire peninsula, maybe the Bay Area, and it's just awesome. So the third spur we have here is from Tasman to Alum Rock, and it opened up completely in 2004. And I really like this spur because it has an elevated platform, which contains the first two above grade stations in the whole transit system. Starting at Tasman once again, we head an east to the nearby Bay Point Station, which serves as a transfer point between the orange and the blue lines. By Bay Point here, you have the cool uh, 121 Tasman and the Vadu, uh, sorry, the Venu Verdant apartments right across the street. I like the multitude of businesses at the Verdant. I just wish they were a little bit closer to Bay Point. Cisco Way and Alder are basically one and the same, unless these companies really invest in building very dense offices that aren't hounded by parking lots. This station, just, <laughs> these shouldn't exist. After this sort of boring segment, we go up on a viaduct for 1.4 miles and reach the Great Mall and Milpitas stations, with the latter being the system's only BART connection. About 10 years ago, there was really nothing west of these stations, just low density office parks, sort of like what we've been seeing up in North San Jose. And now we actually see impressive developments which are sparked by the opening of the Milpitas BART station, which has a, a pedestrian walkway connecting linked riders to the VTA platforms, so it's truly an intermodal station. Developments around here include the Fields, Apex, and Elara apartments, uh, with tenants like Trader Joe's serving upstairs residents. And there's also a super cool pedestrian bridge linking the Milpitas station to the Edge apartments. And I really like that some of these developments are six stories high, so we're ensuring that they're really dense. After these two stations here, the system descends to meet the Cropley and Hostetter stations to the south. Cropley is in a single-family residence dominant area, and so these neighborhoods will be the norm for the rest of the spur. Eve's apartments here at Cropley seem dense-ish. Hostetter Station also has a very big park and ride that's really never used. Further south, Barriessa Station serves a very basic strip mall, and Penitentia Creek and McKee serve some homes and low-density apartments right next to the stations. The purpose of all these stations south of Milpitas seem to be that they're places where residents in the surrounding suburban area can park and then take the light rail to their place of interest. This is the same story at Alum Rock, which is the current terminus. I do like the Monte Vista and La Hacienda apartments that flank the parking lot of this transit center. A reason I think that building TOD is very difficult from the Cropley to Alum Rock segment is because these are suburbs that were built in the car-centric 1950s. And unless the homeowner sells or there's some sort of very forceful eminent domain, there's not a lot of room for development to occur. And usually, a lot of TODs are just built on former office or commercial space, which is why it's so much easier to build TOD in North San Jose when there aren't too many uh, single-family homes. What's really great news, though, is that the Orange Line is going to get 2.4 miles longer. Construction is commencing soon at two new stations past Alum Rock. 
There will be an above grade one at Story Road and an at grade one right next to East Ridge Mall and its transit center. We're also seeing a really cool aerial right of way right alongside Capitol Expressway. The project's gonna open in 2029, supposedly, and it currently stands at around $500 million, which is a cool $213 million per mile. There is a projection of 4,000 daily boardings in 2043, and I honestly really hope it's higher than that by that year. Uh, I think VTA needs to make a huge effort with the city to convert a lot of strip malls that surround Capital Expressway to affordable housing and TOD. And finally, we have our last spur from the Convention Center to Santa Teresa, which opened up in 1991. What's unique about this spur, though, is that the entirety of it runs in the median of two freeways, the 87 and the 85. And both of them were actually built in conjunction with the light rail line, so keep in mind that all of this was planned preemptively. Beginning at the Convention Center, the line actually diverts south instead of west at Waz Way, and it stops at the Children's Discovery Museum. I really like direct stations for attractions, because it really makes riding public transit part of the whole fun experience. The Virginia Station now connects the North Willow Glen neighborhood to light rail, but it's mainly surrounded by single-family housing predating the tracks and the highway. We now reach the system's third Caltrain connection at Tamian, where riders coming from the south can transfer onto Caltrain by walking under a very dark and scary uh, tunnel underneath the Highway 87. In addition to the surprisingly tall and sort of disconnected skyline development, we're going to see 550 units built right next door, which is exciting to see. If you really like transit-oriented development like me, do yourself a huge favor if you ever visit the VTA light rail and don't stop at any of these next three stations. They don't take into account at all their surrounding communities, and they're just littered with adjacent strip malls and faraway single-family homes that really cater to the park-and-ride crowd. Capital Station, ironically, is located next to the city's car dealership strip, so that says a lot. Another cool oasis, the Ohlone China West Station. The commons here are dense, they have a bunch of green space, and there's a walking past the station. There's a cool Somali food spot and mini market, so that everything you need here. This station used to be a transfer station, actually, for the three-station Almaden shuttle, but very poor ridership caused it to close in late 2019. I'm not sure why this weird shuttle was even built. It was only uh, 1.2 miles long. The Blossom Hill Station has a very scary walkway to the, the Velasco Park community up north. Not the most ADA accessible. Um, but otherwise, it kind of stands isolated in rows of empty parking spots. So here we are. Uh, we're dropped off in the middle of a highway. This is the Highway 85. And it's really really loud so all of these highway stations with medians drop you in the middle of these very very loud highways granted this highway was built in conjunction with the light rail system so they planned for this at least snow is a little bit better in right in being right next to the strip mall though which is okay ah <sighs> coddle 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 you've got the beautiful charlotte park and avenue one apartments directly north of you and you don't have a pedestrian bridge or some sort of linkage incentivizing people that live there to use the light rail. And finally, finally, I think the worst offender here, we have our final terminus station at Santa Teresa sitting in a depressing and deteriorating parking lot. Let's take a look. I mean, this is just super empty. Like, this is nothing but like dead trees some really really old asphalt and uh just like it's not really a semblance of anything useful here you know this can be home to thousands of people really i mean we have a huge housing crisis here in silicon valley and vta is doing nothing but i guess paving asphalt and just kind of leaving it to die silicon valley should do better and can do better this is just this is crazy, man. So after analyzing every station here on the four spurs in the central corridor, let's actually talk about some of the overarching problems that the system has. There's extremely low, lightersh low ridership, and I mean very low, um, when comparing it to other light rail systems. Like even in the Bay Area, like the average weekday ridership here is 12,500. The Muni Metro light rail system in smaller by population San Francisco has a ridership of 78,000, which is more than six times as much. Considering that the population that light rail serves 
is 1.46 million here in Silicon Valley, that means that only 0.09% of people use it, which is nine out of every 10,000. VTA replaced their 1980s era fleet in 2002 with new kinky Shario trains. And kind of just stepping on them, you can seriously tell at their age. Because of these old behemoths, VTA pays more for parts on its light rail vehicles than any other transit agency in the country. The agency at some point has run out of antifreeze and gear oil, you know, the things that you actually need. And that's because the cars are so, so old that the fault monitoring system doesn't even exist. Keep in mind, these are from 2002. So workers don't even know what's wrong with the cars at times, and they don't replace parts because they don't know what's wrong with them. That's concerning. There are very glaring and obvious places where light rail lines should be running. First, people in the Alum Rock area really do deserve a double track light rail line in the median of Santa Clara Street, which directly connects them to downtown, instead of a much slower semi-bus rapid transit line. Spur 2 is an absolute mess with these weird twists and turns at random streets that don't seem to have any points of interest. It's also a mostly soulless ride too, and many would be dissuaded from taking this, and even me being a transit lover, unfortunately, is one of them. There are also just better options from getting from Mountain View to downtown San Jose, and you know, Caltrain is a much better alternative. Also, the entirety of Spur 4 is very strange too, as highways 87 and 85 were built in conjunction with the light rail line. It seems kind of like more like a compromise than anything. I think some city officials wanted to extend the light rail, but some wanted a highway and they just kind of bred this, you know, this abomination of a light rail line, right? I know some cities like LA kind of do this with their green line. Like, I don't like those either. I don't like getting off the train on a glorified highway median being bombarded by a sound of a thousand autos, you know? A light rail system where its northern portion serves low density buildings that are only occupied at most 10 hours out of the day seems destined to have lower ridership. In theory, having train service to workplaces isn't a bad idea, but when the corporate campuses are sprawling and are easier to get to by driving, there's no incentive for any tech workers to take the train from where they live in the first place. TODs provide incentives for people not to drive in the first place, um, and there are small steps taken, like at the Wisman or River Oaks developments but big tech doesn't care to build developments that are walkable or even accessible by transit in the first place. The spur to Mountain View is the most flawed for this reason since the line just cuts through a sea of silicon. I really like what VTA did with its Winchester extension for the most part, giving light rail vehicles their own right of way and building around that like at Race and Fruitdale is exactly what the VTA system needs. I like the Eastridge extension, but there needs to be a TOD plan put in place at the same time. Otherwise, there won't be ridership as high as the agency might even want it to be, and that's key. TOD options vary with San Jose and the rest of Silicon Valley, as some stations are very well integrated in into the community, while other stations drop riders off in the middle of a parking lot with no housing or commercial spaces even visible. This video took me a while to make, but I really wanted to make sure I covered all the bases with VTA. Thank you so much if you made it this far, and I'll see you next time.